representing Emilio the Honey Badger Urutia! I'm JP. I'm JP. I'm the Stanza. Now here's the news you need to know. It's your boy, Emilo, the Honey Badger Urudio, with our host, JP the Suit Mestenza. What's up? What's up? And ladies and gentlemen, today we have a very special guest, my longtime friend and teammate, UFC flyweight competitor, Tiger Muay Thai season one tryouts winner, my man's Kai Kara, don't blink France. What's happening, baby? Hey. What's up, DBK. Yo, what's good happening, man. big dog Kai? <laughs> I'm good, bro. Last time I saw you, I was getting my hand raised UFC Oakland. My man, the last time, that, that's why I got this shirt, baby. That's why I'm wearing hey. this shirt. I was going to wear I was gonna wear your Kai Kara shirt, but I wear that shit on like, if I've been on it, like in like 10 of the 20 podcasts we're on, I'm wearing that shirt like every uh, other dude. episode. Actually, last episode yeah. that we're going to release, I'm wearing the shirt, so I had to switch it up. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have been wearing wow. the Kai Kara exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad Welcome you're putting the- it to work, bro. Welcome on the podcast, bro. <laughs> nah, privilege. Thanks for having me. I only took 27 episodes, but we're finally here. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> we wanted to make sure we had our game right. You see, every time we, exactly. we every time Down we come, path, boom. every time exactly. we every time we make one, we get where we're, we are a little bit better and better. You exactly. Know? So yeah, we yeah. wanted to come at you correct, and it's a perfect timing, bro. You got we, You just got your fight announced. Mm. Exactly. What's, yeah. What, what date we're looking at? September 26th. September 26th, UFC 43, yeah. UFC 243, right? 243 or 253? I think it's 253. 253, 253. Yeah. And you're going up against Brandon Roy Val. Roy Val? Roy yeah. Val? You know what his nickname is? No. Raw Dog. <laughs> <laughs> he's about to get, so he's about to get a taste of his own, he's about to get a taste of his own yeah. nickname on, on, I'm the, take on his the, name off him. On, on UFC 253. Yo, yeah. how, what amazing, man. And you're going to be the co-main event of the show, right? Nah, I wish I was, but I, I just got stuff to uh, the, the light heavyweight world champions on that card now. Uh, the oh, that's going to be the that's going to be the Reyes fight. Yeah, Reyes versus um was it Bell um Blahovich? What's it? Yeah, Blahovich. Blah- yeah. Oh, Blahovich, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I just this is just breaking mm-hmm. news today, right? As we're speaking, breaking huh? news, bro. First time in nine years the light heavyweight title hasn't involved John Jones or Daniel Cormier. So it's a big fight. So wow. it's a big card. It's going to be a lot of a lot of people watching this, but it's easy for um, for the light heavyweight title fight. So hopefully, I'm still on the main card. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's right. And we were gonna say. I was gonna say. I thought Izzy was the main event. So now Izzy might be the co-main event. Nah, he'll still be main. Is he still be, oh, yeah, think, yeah, all for sure because I it's like it, a... I think it's just a draw card with obviously two undefeated fighters. Um, that That's the one that people will be watching the most. Man, that's yeah, that's going to be like a fight mm. that has a lot of hype behind it, you know? Mm-hmm. Dana yeah. White was saying fight the year. Yeah, for sure. So, oh, we'll man, that's going to be in... It's written all over it. Yeah, that's going to be an epic Costa. clash, man. Oh, Juice said... Oh, Rico, Rico, uh, Iglesias. Rico. Oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> hey, Rico Suave, dog. Yeah. Oh, um, oh, Paulo Juicy Costa. Yeah. I think that, um, yeah, I, I don't know, man. I just feel like this is just going to be a terrible matchup for him, you know? That's going to be a nice oh, exactly. one to watch. Especially because, like, the thing with Izzy, too, is if you bring it to him, it's worse for you, right? Like, the more aggressive you are, yeah. like, the easier it is for him <laughs> to pick you apart. Unless you yeah, do the UL exactly. where you just... <laughs> do nothing <laughs> hey, you know <laughs> the switch step hey switch step you well he was just like yo I'm gonna go in there and if I don't move I can't get tired exactly. <laughs> I love you boy did <laughs> oh, you teach him gosh. that he's a Cuban countryman oh man did I don't you know where he teach him some salsa, salsa? nah he's older than me so he's gonna yo he's like from real Cuba I was born in America you know so I'm like <laughs> I'm like that watered down version you know what I'm saying <laughs> He's straight from the motherland, dog. He's got those Yo. communist genes in him for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that guy's a scary dude, bro. Well, but in he, person. Yeah, but like that's that, um, and now he's got another big old monkey in front of him, bro. This one's gonna be like this one's, I think, a lot less technical. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. So it's gonna be a little bit of a different I sitting, problem. I was sitting next to him at um, when Whitt- uh so Izzy Fort Whitaker for UFC in Melbourne. Yeah, and um, I was I was in between. Oh, sorry, 
Henry Cejudo was in between me and Paul Acosta. This guy's massive. I have, apparently cuts. It takes him about four months to cut down to middleweight. Oh really? Oh, wow. He's because he sits so heavy. Yeah. Oh man, it's, it's there's no longevity in that, right? Nah, sure. so like cutting that crazy weight, right? Like he's yeah, he's a massive. That's the thing with middleweight. Middleweight's that weird weight where like oh, all the middleweights yeah. can be like two hundred fivers, and all the two hundred fivers can kind of be like heavyweights if they choose, right? With that, yeah. once they get to that weight, it's like they're all just gigantic. They're, uh, they're all huge. Mm. Like, like, look at that. Or, who was it? Tim Bochy? I remember seeing him. He's massive. He's a middleweight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's many guys that could just fill up. Anthony Johnson. Uh, Brian Ebersaw. How big would Brian get? Speaking of uh, yeah, like, a middleweight yeah. that we know pretty hand on hand, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But he hey. was a different build, though. He was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He wasn't most athletic, but. But he was a big boy, you know? He would get to, like, yeah. 220, 205, you know what I mean? Just, to like, yeah, that true. frame, that size frame, size of a person, yeah. you know? He had that, like, length half on of that weight's all, Half of that weight's all on his chest there, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that you, you're comes, picking it up after practice, yeah. Yeah, it comes with mouth. a price. <laughs> Yo, speaking of Brian Ebersol, man, when I met you, was fresh after the first ever Tiger Muay Thai tryouts, man. Yeah, I, I was and, part of the first one ever. You were part of the first one ever, and for sure, like they say, right? I think just like the Ultimate Fighter, you know, the first tryout, the first one is always like is one of the, uh, it's probably like one of, always the best, you know, one of the for sure one of the best, man. How was that experience like, man? How did you hear about going to the tryouts when you when you heard about that? Um, I think I I was following Brian Bissell when I saw him posting um, the video of how they want people to um, submit like an application to. Um, to get chosen for these tryouts. So uh, I already had a few pro fights by then. So I was like, you know, what the hell? Um, I want to pursue this career. And um, I could see that as a way of, you know, progressing. Um, cost of living in Thailand wasn't too expensive. Um, I I didn't really like the lifestyle in New Zealand. Like I was at university and um, my parents wanted me to commit to something. And this was kind of my ticket to to do that and to prove to them that, you know, this is what I wanted to do. So, um, yeah, ended up seeing the tryouts and, uh, submitted my application and then got selected a few weeks after, um, had to pay for a t- flight over. Um, and yeah, the rest was history. I went on a one way ticket and, um, went over two weeks before the trial. So that was actually a massive, um, strategy just to get a color. Um, you know how it is in Thailand is so hot and, you want to get adjusted and get used to the climate and the the um, the, the time change um, from New Zealand is about six hours, I think. Um, so yeah, a lot of guys were coming in a week before or a few days before actually for the trials, and um, that was stuffing them up just because they weren't ready for that um, extreme heat. And uh, the one thing that was really hard was we didn't have a blueprint of what to expect. You know, a few guys after you know, saw our videos, saw the docos. Um, they they could um, you know start training for what was to be expected, but we just didn't really know what to expect. I, I treated it like a fight camp. Came over two weeks before. I just jumped into every class, got to just meet new people. You know, I was pretty shy. Um, first first time being overseas by myself. Like I was eighteen, you know, fresh out of um, I was at university, but dropped out, um, just chasing a dream, pretty much. So. Uh, I had a good attitude. I was just willing to learn and um, just young and hungry, bro. So um, I feel like that, that what, is what um, the coaches saw in me and that's what gave me an advantage, just the willing and keenness to learn um, and, and trying to be like a sponge and absorb as much as I could. Yo. But yeah, first time meeting um, JP was over there. He was a cameraman for, for that trials, weren't you? You were, What's right? Up? Yeah, you and Stu, you and Stu Cooper. Um, Jeff, I think, wasn't there for that tryout, but um, he came in not soon um, too, soon after that. So, um, so many OGs from back then, you know, still, we still got connections now. So, it's pretty crazy. It's amazing, man. You know, I was going to tell you, 
you know, I always I saw the tryout videos, and then when as soon as I saw them, I was like, right away, I was like, that's what I need to do, and I just started saving up my money right then to like get to Thailand ASAP, you know. And I remember sp yeah. seeing you specifically in the videos, you know. And I remember it was yeah. kind of like it was kind of crazy when I had seen you in those videos for a while, and then I had been dreaming like, oh, I'm gonna go to Thailand, I'm gonna save up my money, I'm gonna do this. And you're the first person I spoke to after training, man. It was after wrestling practice, yeah. and you're the first guy in the MMA area that I talked to. <laughs> that's and, uh, awesome. In, in uh, Tiger Muay Thai, man. I remember I thought you were from yeah. Australia because I didn't know New Zealand at the time. I never seen the flag. Yeah, and I was like, yo, you from you. Australia? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, nah, New Zealand. And I was like, oh, nice, man. I had no idea. I just kept running. And I remember yeah, we were yeah. running around. You know, we were running in the circle. And you were just telling me about And you had just finished, and you had just finished getting your uh, knockout, that he crazy head kick knockout in Taiwan. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I, like, I remember you were fresh off that knockout buzz. And like, maybe like a week yeah. or so later, I came to Thailand. And then I remember you were telling me yeah. about the tryouts in Taiwan and stuff. Yeah, bro, that's, there's so many crazy stories and fights that I've taken and some fights I shouldn't have taken back in then, but, you know, it's all a part of the journey that you're on and all learning curves. Um, I wouldn't change it any other way. You know, it's why I am where I am today because of those experiences, you know. you just got to adapt, learn, and, and overcome from it. So, um, yeah, pretty pretty amazing to be able to look back on all these experiences that I've had and um, – good and the bad you know ups and downs leaps and bounds smiles and frowns but uh <laughs> yeah it's it's pretty cool that it's all worked out and you still you know got good friends from from back then that you, you still um have this massive connection and we still you know can start train together and somehow our paths always um realign and, and cross over so it's pretty cool hey kai i mean like there's there's uh if there's something to take away from from knowing you all these years is that mm. you've been able to kind of always stay focused on whatever it was that you wanted to accomplish. And so I, I guess like what I'm kind of getting into right now is how did you stay focused while you were at university? Because that you didn't really have any experience to kind of rely upon on staying mm. focused. You know what I mean? Like you didn't have any as much hardship as you have gone through your career to get to the point to yeah. UFC. Like, like right now, I know that that mind of yours is sharpened. What about mm. at university? Take me down to, uh, to to Kai there and then seeing that video. And then, you know, I guess you had to wait, what, two weeks until Tiger replied? How, how like, what was that right wait there. like? Yeah, it was pretty um, pretty hard. Like, I, I just wasn't cut out for um, the books, you know. I couldn't see myself doing a nine-to-five job, being in an office, you know. It just wasn't the type of person that, um, that I am. I have to be moving. I have to be... Um, I have to be you're following is something that um, I'm actually generally inter interested in. I was doing a bachelor in arts. Um, I remember about to do my exams and then I just freaked out and I didn't even turn up to one of them. I was just like, nah, I can't do this. And then I changed my degree to a bachelor in sport. So it's something more relative to like what I'm actually into. Um, didn't turn up to any of my exams somehow <laughs> did the same thing. Just didn't do any of my exams. And, um, and then the next semester, I rejoined again. I was like, you know, let, I need to actually commit to this. I can't keep just doing all the classes and then not following through. Um, and then I did it again. So when these tryouts came out, my head wasn't in the books. You know, it was in training. Like, that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to fight full time and just commit to something. And I kind of made a promise to myself. And that's why I submitted my application to Thailand because this is my ticket to show myself, you know, if I really want to do this, I've got to go all in. I can't half-ass this anymore. I just had to look myself in the mirror and, and be like, you know, if I really want to do it, I have to immerse myself. I have to commit to this lifestyle and and move and move country, get out of my comforts of home, not rely on my friends, on my, my family um, for support. Um, they'll always be there. I knew that, but um, I kind of had to show myself that if I want to do this, I've got to, I got to go all in. So, um Pretty much that's why I jumped in the deep end and, and moved to Thailand, bro, the, the motherland of uh, Muay Thai, and um, started my you know my my long journey to, to where I am now. Yeah, man. For the for the journey, what did your how old were you? Were eighteen when you came to when you the tryouts for the first tryouts? Yeah. And what did 18, your family bro. say? What did your family say when you told them you were thinking about coming over? <laughs> um, when I said you know I'm going over to Thailand and um, I don't know where it's going to lead me, but um, this is my passion and I, I, ha I want to pursue it. And they said, you know, we can't stop you. This is, if you're passionate about it, we're going to have to support you. And they've always been like that. Uh, my, my family's really supportive like that. And 
a lot of a lot of my you know siblings have all gone to university they're all either lawyers or journalists or um you know all academic so for, for me to not take that path was a big thing in my family but um you know it all it all pays off when uh they could see that i was passionate and they they knew that i wanted this you know i didn't want to just um come home empty-handed that's what kind of kept me in thailand i would live there for what, four years i didn't want to come back without something so that's why i had to keep turning up and keep keep fighting and until it all worked out yeah, man, and I remember, um, and you know, it wasn't always easy, you know. And I've been there with you for a lot of the way, man. And we've had you've had your yeah. ups and your downs in your career, but the one thing is, no matter what, you've always stayed the course, you know. And now, look, mm. when you look at the results, I remember when you when you made your UFC debut, and I was we were talking about it, and I was just like, it was one of like sometimes, you know, like your friends are gonna uh, compete and stuff like that. But I remember how confident we were when you were gonna make your USA debut, and like how happy and mm. like because we knew the long road that you took, you know, like um, the road less traveled, yeah. you know, and like. How, don't you feel like all the fights that you've had in the past, like, I feel like they all, how do you feel they've helped you in the future? Like to, when it comes down to the UFC, like, do you feel you have a little bit more edge over your opponents that because of the experience that you've accumulated before you mm -hmm. even got there? Yeah, definitely. You know, I was doing this a long time and when you're in Thailand and you see like little kids fighting, you know, at the same age of like five to six and see how they're putting food on their table. Um, that put a lot of perspective in my eyes where I don't need to put, what we do on such a big pedestal. Obviously, there's a lot of high risk, high stakes. Um, you know, your 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 next fight could be, you know, um, the biggest fight of your career, and your next loss could be detrimental to your career. But you just don't want to put pressure on yourself like that. And and the ties are really good at at, at um, having that kind of lifestyle where they don't they they care, but they also don't care. You know, they just get in there, and this is what they do. So that's the kind of mindset I kind of took and uh, took on board. And, uh, you know, I was just here to fight. I, I was fighting pretty much every week. If it wasn't MMA, it was boxing. If it wasn't boxing, it was kickboxing or Muay Thai. Um, I was just competing as, as, as much as I could and just trying to get as much experience as I could. So um, that's why I racked up so many fights while I was over there. I was pretty much fighting every month. You, got, you guys saw it. I was in another country every month doing a visa run. You know, not only having to fight, but the pressures of leaving the country, having to sort that out on the on the side, as well as um, getting ready to compete. And uh, I didn't really have a coach back then, you know, like I do now with Eugene Behrman. Um, the team was coaching themselves, you know. We, we had our coaching staff, you know, George and, and Brian and, and Roger. Um, but ultimately, the coach was the, – the team was coaching itself, and you were just – talk to your mate you know i'd be like demolo you you fighting this weekend or you want to come out and um and uh go on go on a lad strip with me and then that's just how it was was back then you know it was like the wild west but like now looking back on it you're like man how did i even do that with no corner man or or just my mate you know we didn't have advice or a game plan we just got in there and stuck and put our heads down and, and put on our mouthpieces and just swung <laughs> and um Yo, how many different countries have we been together together, Bubba? We've been to we've been on quite a few trips, man. And we've been Bro, through so the lows yeah. of the lows. And I've been there with you. Yo, we've had the bad <laughs> ones where we both go down. You know what I'm saying? Remember the rape of <laughs> yeah, right. remember Nanjing, bro? I was about to say, like, I gotta stop getting on cards with you because you might be my, my bad luck. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Every time we're on the cards together. <laughs> nah, but um, what's it called? We you did good on the the Nanjing one after Nanjing. Then we yeah. went to um, Taiwan, and that's when you had Taiwan, your big yeah. comeback, man. We got the come, we got the, yeah. you got the big K. We got like the how fast was that knockout in Taiwan, man? That's a good Nine spot seconds. for you. Yeah, it was my debut at flyweight. So, oh, that was your first time making flyweight. Yeah, I remember. I remember that so clearly because I was on a three fight lose streak, bro. Me too. I remember. I just fought. Yeah, it was a rough time for us. Um, I just fought the Chinese guy that I lost to before that I lost to Mark Striegel. And then before that I lost to this Brazilian, um, Gustavo, Gustavo, Gustavo. Yes. Yeah. So I was on a three fight loose streak. Uh, I kind of lost. Didn't know if I should come back to New Zealand. I was in a crossroad where my family had stopped. Didn't have stopped, but I didn't want to ask them for money anymore. Um, I knew my time in Thailand was running out. So I was just like, I'm going to just train as hard as I can all in, all or nothing right now to get me out of this three fight loose streak. That's what I cut down to flyweight. I thought it would be more beneficial for my career. And um, 
just trained for four months and then I took a fight on their Pro FC. That was my flyweight debut. And then, yeah, all turned around and in nine seconds ended up getting that highlight reel knockout. And then I fought on the cruise ship um, two weeks later mm-hmm. on uh, the MEMA. And the MEMA. Um, yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, ended up getting a 12 second knockout on the boat, which was awesome. Um, so, you know, in, in the space of a month, I had less than 30 seconds of actual ring time. So um, crazy to just turn things around, but it's all about persp- perspective and um, just, you know, looking at the bigger picture, um, taking the smarter fights and just having a bit more guidance to where I actually want to end up. I just didn't want to just take fights just for the sake of it, making money. Um, and then ended up, you know, getting on a five fight win streak and then ultimately getting picked up for the ultimate fighter season 24. So um, that was all in one year, pretty much. I remember, Change man, that was a big, that was a big turnaround for you. And I remember that was always one of my motivations, you know, telling you the truth, like coming up, um, I feel like I've been in the same spot in you a few different times. And, uh, I remember when we went to yeah. China together, we had that rough night where like everybody from Phuket lost, you know, and I was, yeah. that was my first loss ever that time. It was like, you know how China is. It was one of those typical China trips, freezing yeah. arena. You know what I'm saying? Like just everything <laughs> yeah. at odds, you know, taking some crazy flight out uh, anyway, but man, um, that was a big turning point for me, you know, and I remember th- and that was your, that was your last yeah. loss before you went on a big run, you know, and then we fought on that Taiwan yeah. card. And I remember afterwards I had, I had lost and then you won and then we had like a little talk afterwards and you were like, yo man, you know, it's was like, I was just on a three fight losing streak and I had only lost, I had lost two in a row and I was pretty down, you know, and you were like, yo, I was just three and mm-hmm. I was lost three and oh, I gave up everything to come yeah. out here and I lost three in a row, you know? And I was like, yeah. and I was just like, that was like a big motivation for me, man, you know, like, and it, and then when you see you get to the UFC, it's amazing because you see you take the road less traveled. You know, you took the you always took the yeah, hardest exactly, fights. Bro. You took you always took the hardest fights, which you think oh maybe they weren't good for my career, but then it ended up making you like way tougher and way more experienced when it comes down now. <clears throat> exactly, but like I, before I made my UFC debut, you know, um, I wanted to make sure that I was more than ready. So like I, I wanted to take hard fights. I wanted to feel what it's like to fight high level competition because in the UFC there's no easy fight there's no um two not fights it's just whoever you're given is the guy and and you don't want to be in and out and no one even remembers your name um which happens you know some people get shocked by the level uh but when I made my debut you know it was like I was supposed I was meant to be here uh it was destined for me and that's what Eugene was saying in my ear when I was walking out for my debut he said you're born to do this um so it was pretty like nostalgic and just special moment. These are life moments that you always have. And then ended up winning fight the night for that, um, for my debut for the UFC Perfect. in Adelaide. So mm-hmm. it couldn't have, it couldn't have gone any better, you know, in front of my friends and family. Um, and then um, just in February earlier this year, you know, I, I brought you over, Emilio, to come over and hang out and and uh, you know watch watch um, all of this, you know, in front of you. You've seen all the hard work and um, you've been about it. So just. It was kind of cool to have you there, you know, to see the behind the scenes and then for all of it to work out again, the three beat me, Dan and Brad all winning on the night. It was pretty, it's pretty overwhelming and it's pretty special, right? Mate, when you walked out, you shut the, you shut the place <laughs> down, dog, when you came out and you came, what was the song that you came out to? When you came out to the, to, to a classic, to a national, like the classic song, right? It's a, it's a famous song yeah, from New like Zealand. A, it's, a, it's a real famous New Zealand song. It's called Poye. It's like a, a Maori song, like the native, um, language of our uh, of new zealand it's like a even like all the old heads it's from their time like in the 1980s 1990s but the younger generation old as well so once that song came on i knew it was gonna pop off oh, it was like mate. 10 o'clock in the morning <laughs> oh you had the crowd man you had the crowd i remember when you picked <laughs> yo i got i remember when coming into new zealand jp i got picked up in the don't blink machine my man kai had, he had his don't, we had the custom whip you know showed him how to show me how he's living in the gym <laughs> i was and seeing you guys put in the work man it was like Mm. oh man i d g t right i don't get <laughs> that's yeah, a, there's a reason don't why though time, there's a reason man. why you know <laughs> man and um you were saying like um when you made your debut you ended up you wasn't you always wanted to fight in new zealand right when you came up there was mm. and when you came up fighting right what was was there a, yeah. a, was the ufc never never been to a new zealand or australia before huh um yeah the first time was when mark hunt debut uh sorry headlined no sorry it was james tahuna headlined against nate markwood um that's the debut that dan was on that was his ufc debut so i I wasn't there i must i was i wasn't even at the card and and i was in auckland um 
And then the second time they came was uh, when Mark Hunt fought, who was it? Um, Derek Lewis. And then the third time I, I had, I had to be on this card. So I, well, that, that was when I just um, fought in December. I fought Brandon Moreno on when Alex won against Max Holloway for this, uh, to win this title. Yes. Um, the fight was pretty much eight weeks after that show. So I knew I was just going straight back into camp and I, I couldn't miss out. So um, quick turnaround for me, uh, but I had to be a part of it. You know, this is my dream and I wasn't going to let anything stop it injury wise or, you know, yeah, man, burnt out or not. I was just like, let's just run it back, you know. You've been pretty busy, man. How many fights have you had already in the UFC? Uh, I've had five fights in the UFC. And how long have you been signed for? Since 2018. 2018. So two years. But you bagged up, you bagged yeah. up the first five fights years. pretty quickly, huh? Like you, you, got them, you got them in pretty quick. Yeah. Man. Pretty quick, bro. Because I signed December 2018. So that was at the end of the year. 2019 was a busy year. Um, I thought 220 was going to be a busy year, but... <laughs> um, you know, we can still get a few. We can still get a few more fights in. You know, if I come out unscathed, I would love a quick turnaround as well. So, um, I'm just trying to fight as much as I can now. Yeah, man. And then, uh, what year did you go to? You went. You were part of the. Were you part of the first flyweight UFC? Correct. You were part of the the champions division in the, in the UFC for the flyweights. Um. Yeah. Well, that and was the, and the, fighter, and the, that I'm was sorry. You were you were part of the the season, the first season of the Ultimate Fighter with the flyweights. Correct. Yeah, yeah, season and, twenty-four. I think there's about five of us still on the on the roster. Nice man. And you were on Team Cejudo. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Team Cejudo is my coach. How did you enjoy? We're still we're still boys. Yeah, nice man. And how did you enjoy? How did yeah. you enjoy being on the Ultimate Fighter, man? How was that experience like for you? Were you a lot more? Were you because you were already kind of like a veteran by that time, huh? During traveled the world and been to all these countries when you went over there. Yeah, I I, I had a lot of fights um, before that show. Um, I remember the week before I went in the house, it, um, Dan just had his wedding in Phuket. So it was like real cool that uh, Is Israel and, and Eugene were there as well. Um, and Izzy wasn't, even, Izzy wasn't even in the UFC by then. So me and him, um, we know, you know, flying under the radar, all at Dan's wedding. Um, I remember the, all the groomsmen came on scooters and then okay. Dan's wife, um, um, Izzy, she came on a boat with her dad. And was waiting at the chapel so it was pretty cool to kind of be there just a week before i went into the house and then um yeah i was in lockdown for about seven weeks so no internet no cell phone no no tv no music um no music. for seven weeks so no nah, music man, it was crazy i didn't nah, know no music the only time we could hear music was in the the vans on the way to training that's just because i had the radio on but no iPod shuffle. it was because they're filming 24 7. no nah, no ipod shuffle nothing bro so um that was pretty hard just being away from family and um, being surrounded by, you know, 16 other guys. But it was cool that we all had each other to kind of lean on and and we were all in the same boat. We are all, you know, hurting, missing our families, but we're here for the for one reason, you know. We all want to get a contract or, you know, further our careers and, and get signed to the UFC. So um, amazing opportunity, but making flyweight, you know, every week was brutal. That was probably the hardest part about it. If I ever had to do that again, I would go up for weight class. I couldn't do it at fly. Just because it was so harsh on your body, man. Like not eating and still having to be like charismatic for the cameras, and um, it was just stressful. So, yeah, if I did that again, I would definitely have to go up a weight class. But I'm still close with um, a lot of guys from the from the show. A few, dis um, you know, a few assholes that you know don't know um, how to act. You know, under pressure, they kind of broke. Um, but you know, I'm still mates with Henry. I'm still mates with Joe Benavides. You know, unlucky for his last fight, last two fights, but. That's the game. Um, but, yeah, Henry, um, he still, you know, stays in contact. And if I see him at shows, you know, we have a good catch-up and stuff. But um, I'd love to fight him one day as well. Yeah. Were you able to Were you able to train with him when he was your coach on the Ultimate Fighter? Were you getting a lot of hands-on experience training with him? Yeah. I, um, like, I just picked his brain as much as I could, especially for, like, wrestling and um, putting that into MMA. Um, uh, working with his coach, Eric, um, or Captain Eric, as they call him. The guy with the he, glasses, he was, right? Um, yeah, the guy with the glasses. Um, another hype man. <laughs> yeah, the hype man. Uh, he, he was all good. <laughs> um, it was cool. I was just trying to pick as much as I could. You know, being from Tiger, we weren't really exposed to... Um, well, we were exposed to the, that level of wrestling, but just to kind of open my eyes and see, you know, these guys aren't doing much different 
differently to what we're already doing. So um, you know, it made me realize, you know, is the grass actually greener on the other side? And that, that's one of the reasons why I did come back to New Zealand because um, collectively we all knew that in America and the other side of the world, they weren't on the level of what we were doing with our stand-up or our striking. And um, we just needed to bring all our other games up to par with, with our striking game, which is the grappling and wrestling. So um, I feel like we've definitely found the blueprint of how to do it now. And that's why we could all bring it back to New Zealand and now be homegrown and, and do it from our, from our backyard. So it's pretty cool and it's all full circle. So, um, yeah, that, that's just how the fight game is. you got to um, adapt pick and choose what works for you and um yeah that's that's just how it is at ckb now yeah that's beautiful man that's and amazing you were um yeah so after the ultimate fighter you were you training yeah. you weren't training at ckb full-time yet or when did you make the move to ckb of uh, uh permanently um i made the move after i lost in japan so i i took a fight after the ultimate fighter i didn't get i didn't get picked up i got the only knockout of the season uh, made it to the semifinals, lost to Alexander Pantoja, who's the number five ranked flyweight right now. Um, didn't get picked up uh, and then ended up taking a fight in Risen um, against a tough opponent. Um, cuff kicked the shit out of me. Yeah. <laughs> learned, learned a hard lesson that night um, and took an L. But um, that made me realize, you know, when I made my UFC debut, I want to make sure I'm ready. And right now I'm not ready. So. It was kind of a blessing in disguise. Just had to look at it a different way. Uh, but I knew then I had to change something, and that was to come back home. Um, I, I'd already been training a little bit with Eugene when he would come over to Thailand. Um, but then when I decided to make a move to come home, uh, you know, he helped, uh, opened his gym, um, welcomed me, and he said, you know, this is your home now if you, if you want to make it, and we'll help you get back to the UFC. Um, he just said, all you need to do is turn up the training. So uh, I trusted him. And two years later, uh, I made my UFC debut. So um, I was on a five-fight win streak. I was fighting in China, Australia, um, at, ban at bantamweight and flyweight. Uh, we were just kind of racking up fights and, and racking up the wins as we could. And then, um, yeah, ended up getting picked up. But that was a big move. I realized that in Thailand, it was great training, great experience. I you know, met so many amazing people like you guys and um, all the coaches. But um, I realized I was lacking one thing, and that was – a head coach that would keep me accountable. There was only so much I could learn, um, you know, because I was kind of on my own schedule. The thing about Tiger, you know, you, you boys know it, is um, everyone's got their own kind of schedule and no one really cares what they do like all day. You know, they could come in halfway and then in the evening. But if, if no coach is looking over them constantly, you kind of lose that little bit of detail that you need and um, I feel like that's what I was lacking in. So coming to CKB, you know, if you're, temp if you're one minute late and you're the world champ of the world, it doesn't matter, you know, you're, you're late and you're going to get punished. So that that's the kind of uh, mentality that, we're, that we have at our gym. You know, no one's no one. And um, when it's time to train, there's no, you know, laughing. And there's, oh, there, you, you can joke around, but it, when it's business time, it's, it's time to put in that work. So that's just how it is here. And everyone's on the same playing field. Everyone's on the same, um, everyone has that same mindset, you know, just let's just um, sharpen each other's tools and, and work and, and um, push each other as hard as you can. So you can see that it's working out this gym and that's the recipe that um, is making us so successful. Yeah, definitely, man. So that's, that's definitely going to be like one of the tributes that you made. It must've been really crushing, mm -hmm. man, to like, you did the ultimate fighter and then to have to go out again. And then when you take that outside fight, and to be able to bounce back, that, was, that probably had to be like a lot. It's like, you know, like just there, you know, like once again, and you had to yeah. work, you, you had to work. Just and, the tip, right? <laughs> yeah, just, but you had to, but you, but you put your nose back down and you made the adjustments you needed to mm. make. And then you went to work again, man. That's what I was going to say. You had, a, before you went to the UFC, you had a really active streak, huh? You were like, you were fighting all the time, huh? Five. Like just five. Yeah, five fight win streak. So I took three fights in seven weeks. Wow. Just before that, you, the second time the UFC came to Auckland, was uh, the Mark Hunt, Derek Lewis fight. Um, I was campaigning to get on there. So I, to campaign, I, I fought three times in seven weeks. Um, yeah, fighting hard guys as well. But I was just like, if, if they're not going to give me my shot, I'm going to make them, you know, at least take notice. Um, I find, unfortunately, didn't get picked up before that UFC Auckland card, but they recognized me and they said, you know, stay stay close to weight and we'll, we'll see what we can do. But I had to fight another two times before... 
it finally happened. But um, the good thing about our gym, you know, there's so many eyes on us now. And um, when when Eugene says, you know, I've got a guy that um, is going to, you know, make moves in the UFC, the, the UFC actually listen now. And, um, you know, there's, there's a blueprint in that. And we've all kind of lived up to... Um, you know the the credibility that Eugene or the City Kickboxing comes with our name. Um, you got to you know that's half the battle getting in the UFC, but then you know actually making um, making your worth and and um, sticking to you know the the promises that you made that this guy will be you know he'll show you how good he is. So um, that's why you know we we don't take it lightly when we get picked for the UFC, but when we make our debut, we're always ready. You know, you can see the confidence in us when we make that walkout. There's nothing that will be surprising us or um, that we haven't seen in the gym already, or there's no, we will never be tired in a fight, you know, or we'll always be as conditioned as, you know, the top, top fighters in the world. That's just how, how it is at our gym. You know, if you make for a city kickboxing 10 week fight camp, um, yeah, you can make it for anything. That's, that's the way I see it. Nice, man. And you were fought when you were before making that run, man. You had to do like those five fights in a row. Do you feel like that made it like? Oh, I'm sorry, blah. Got to <laughs> got to think about it. Yeah, all good. For the uh, for the conditioning, is there anything that you guys do specifically that's different uh, compared to other gyms, or like uh, with your strength and conditioning that you guys do in New Zealand? Um, just high volume, bro. Like you would have, you've seen it when you were here on fight week, you know, even leading up to fight week, we don't taper off at all until, you know, the last few days, this is how it is. Um, so yeah, we, we don't leave any guesswork, you know, we, we make sure that, um, the rounds are being put in, the work's been there and there's just no guess game anymore. You know, you're fit because this, there's this science and the numbers back it up um, and I have a strength and, con- and conditioning coach that I'm working with Sons. he works with a lot of like professional athletes especially in rugby and soccer and athletics um, he helps with our conditioning um, so we see him twice a week uh, obviously there's a city kickboxing routine that we have that we um, you know we're training at the gym twice a day so in the mornings and the evenings um, and then we're fitting in our rehab in, in between that. So I tr- um, I'm with physiologic uh, Gabe is our physio that looks over my uh, looks over me where I, you know I try to um, as much um, prevention injury prevention as well as you know m- uh, mobility as I can, and um, also see a sports psychologist as well, Dave Leith, um, Neith. Sorry, he helps us out with you know the yeah, added pressure of fighting and. Um, all the stress that comes with it, um, especially in this game, you know, if you, your mental's not there, um, that's the, that's the battle right there. It's all fighting's all 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 to do with your mental and all to do with your um, what you're doing upstairs. So if you're, you're training physically, putting all the stuff into your nutrition, but you're not doing anything to do with your mental side, um, that's everything. So it plays a big part. Yeah. And then also, you know, I work with a fight dietitian that uh, Jordy helps. He's been helping me cut to fly weight this whole time, you know, without him, I wouldn't be able to make fly weight and, um, perform like I do. So, um, he's a big part of our team. And, um, I obviously have a meal prep sponsor as well. Think food, which helps, um, you know, with convenience, dropping my meals off to the gym and it's already made. So the fight dietitian, Jordy talks to them to think, think food and then they make my meals and then it's just so much more easier. Um, and then one thing we've just added into our regime is, um, a breath breathing coach. So um, it's it's one of these things that's a massive trend right now, um, but it makes a lot of sense. You know, we do all these things to try get that one percent. But if you don't know how to breathe properly and be efficient and um, you know uh, control your emotions and your feelings and your body um, and fighting especially, um, it's a massive. It can um, give you a massive ad- advantage and. Uh, the guy that we're working with, Dave Wood, he um, has taken us for a few sessions already, um, especially in like the ice baths and um, just being able to control um, when you're in that, you know, stress level of, of training and those later rounds, control your breathing and, and really recover in that one minute that you have in between the rounds um, makes a massive difference. So we're trying to do as much as we can to, to get that um, 1% ad, um, advantage over our um, competitors and um yeah it's it's a pretty cool um system that we have you know there's so many things that we're slotting in just to um get advantages but 
after a 10 week camp, you know, you can go into fight week fully prepared, fully, um, fully ready for, for anything, five round war or whatever the fight is. Yeah. Nice, man. And you go, yo, and you guys are at the gym. You're at the gym right now, right? Yeah, bro. So we're living at the gym. We've been here for a week now. Um, we're in level three lockdown. So that means that you can only be in a bubble of 10. Um, you can't go to your house now. This is your, this is your home. So Eugene pretty much said, you boys are staying in the gym. There's four of you on this card. There's a few others that could be on the contender series. Nice. Um, I can't, I can't say names or anything just yet, but, um, they're, they're in our bubble as well. They're, they're training with us. So we've got a lot of exciting things coming up, but the, the work's still getting put in. Even though we're in lockdown, it doesn't get delayed. You know, we, we're still going to make sure that we're, um, you know, sacrificing our time and using it wisely. So yeah. it's, pretty, it's like a school camp. It's like a school <laughs> camp. Eugene's the coach. That's awesome. Um, everyone's just excited to kind of just be around each other, you know. Usually we're always around each other anyway. We're all close with each other, but now we're sleeping, you know, in the same rooms. I actually got a physio room, so you you can see my bed there. I'm not in the in the marae with all the other guys, the with all the t- like ten other beds in the other room. Yeah. I've got my own room, which isn't too bad. This is a little trick. What I learned in Ultimate Fighter, you got to be first in. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, when you were in Ultimate Fighter, how was your room in Ultimate Fighter? Did you get a good room? No, oh, I just get the big room, but I, I got the good bunk bed. Yeah, yeah. I got the one bottom with the ensuite. Oh, okay. But um, a lot of yeah, that's, you, good. that's how you got to do yeah. it. You don't you don't want to get on the top bunk. Nah, mm. nah, nah, nah. Yeah, you're in you're in there for a long time. That's for amateurs. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So yo, uh, you guys are able to like, do you, can you get grab food and stuff like that? Can you leave the hotel or you got to stay pretty close within the area? Yeah, so we're so the. The gym downstairs is where we're training. Upstairs on the jiu-jitsu mats, that's where everyone's living, yeah. mostly. So, you know, Israel and Brad, they're all in there. Um, and the rest of the physio rooms, that's where Eugene and, and me, Carlos and Shane are staying. Nice. Um, everyone brought their PS, PS4, so you've got COD playing. Downstairs is like the movie room as well. There's a big kitchen, bathroom, showers. Yeah, that's awesome. Outside, there's a big bar. Yeah, outside, there's a big barbecue. <laughs> Um, we all bought our bikes and shit so we can go for bike rides when it's nice weather. Yeah. Um, so it's not too bad. We're going to go down to the countdown where, where the grocery store is. Cool. You can still do Uber Eats and stuff. So nice. you're just limited to tr- local travel. Um, and obviously you can't, you can't go back to your house when you've reset and relocated your, your bubble um, of living. So another week of this and then hopefully we can uh, go back to level two. Uh, which means we can go back to our houses and train like normal, um, just not living at the gym. So it's not too bad. It's just like summer camp. Yeah, literal, or, um, a literal training camp. Pretty much. Yeah. You know, you can. Sh- which is cool. We're getting we're getting quality work though. Like, um, when you don't, you don't have much to do all day, you you just absorb it as much as you can. Try to pick as much as you can from Eugene and and the boys are you know just keen to to help each other out. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, and you're probably really fresh, right? <clears throat> Like meaning like yeah, you don't exactly. have like a lot of distractions. You, you don't up. have to go home, drive here, drive there, get ready. Nah. You can just sleep, rest in between. Exactly. So it's kind of like old school, you know? Yeah. It's like, cause when yeah, you got to the exactly. UFC like, and you got big time, you know, you, now you got, you got, a, you got the car, you got media obligations. You had to go to the radio shows. There's a lot of stuff, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of, um, you know, extra admin that you have to deal with, but people still like to push it though. Even though we're living at the gym, people like to be one minute just before we start class and I'll quickly get out of bed <laughs> just to get that little bit of extra sleep in. But, you know, that's just up, that's up to them. I can't do that. I have to be up, make a coffee or um, at least wash my face or something. But some of these boys, they, they give Eugene a heart attack. You know, he's yelling, <laughs> screaming, say, one minute, one minute. If you're not downstairs, you're not jumping in class. Yeah, yeah. But, um, and I heard that was a trick yeah, that uh, – There's no excuses now. I heard that was what Marcelo Garcia would do before his ADCC, his big ADCC uh, matches. He would take a big sleep and then like maybe five minutes before his match, he would just wake up and then he would go and – and warm up as much as he could and then go into it. So right after some sleep. Oh, yeah. So, hey, I'm just making an excuse for those people, eh? Because I'm always late. <laughs> That's hey. this guy. <laughs> well, well, yeah, exactly. It must work because one of them wins. Uh, it's got the middleweight world title. So hey. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> hey. That, that might be the secret. <laughs> hey, no names. Uh, yeah. Hey, with all the experience and you have, Kai, you fought all over the world, man. You fought in Guam, Hong Kong, right? You fought in Hong Kong before? 
Yeah, four in thirteen countries. You fought in thirteen so. different and countries. And the Andaman Sea, right off of the coast of Phuket, not on land. Yeah, and, and you fought on a boat. You waters. fought outside <laughs> in a boat in international waters. Yeah, bro. It's safe to say you've done it, done all, it all, bro. But have you fought in front of no tough, crowd? Tough. Well, tough and ultimate fighter. Oh, that's right. There's a little bit of crowd. So. Oh, You're better in, in everything. Look at that. You <laughs> even got yo. You hit. You even, I was going to say, this guy's a mad yeah. veteran, but you're about to, you even hit the no audience. That's exactly what I'm assuming those fight is going to be like. It's going to be like the ultimate fighter, man. Yeah. I remember that, man, like that when I made my UFC, uh, so my ultimate fighter debut, I was the first, first fight. So on the first week, there was two fights and um, I was one of them. Yo. And uh, I remember, I remember Dana walking in our room saying, good luck, boys. Um, don't leave it to the judges. And then, um, that's when it switched. I was just like, "Fuck, I'm, I'm not, I'm not leaving here without getting a hard real knockout." Like, I'm, I'm coming from, I'm just on pure violence. I'm coming for his head. So, about making that walkout, there's no music, nothing. They're just like, "Yep, yeah, the cameraman's here." So, you're making the walk in three, two, one, and then he pushes the door, and then you, you walk out. You got your coaches behind you, but they're not really your coaches. They just got your single on. Um, the teams are there, both on the both bleachers, and then there's Dana White, Sean Shelby. And and Mick McMaynard were right there. Um, we'll pass him. So this is like straight into it. No, there's no TV. Also, there's no music. There's no actual crowd. There's just the teams and the judges around the ring. So I've already done this before. I've already visualized it. Perfect. Um, and, I, and I've lived in it, you know. So I remember getting the 30, 30 second knockout right in front of Dana White, having him on his feet, saying, you know, this is what exactly what we wanted to start the flyweight um you know, season 24 saying they can't have knockouts. Look, he just proved them wrong. So um, I've already felt that pressure on me before. So coming into this next fight, potentially being fight island or Vegas, um, having no crowds is just another day for me. You know, I've done this before. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And do you have a, do you have a, you have, a, are you going to have, do you have a new walkout plan? Do you got something nice? <laughs> yeah. I want to, uh, obviously I'll bring something that um, hits home. I want to bring, New Zealand with me, um, obviously having three corner, um, teammates on the card with me as well for my coaches and cornermen. Um, it's going to feel like that anyway in the in the locker rooms. I want to just feel com um, comfortable and confident. Um, so I'll bring I'll bring something with me um, that's nice. iconic. Um, but yeah, I don't know yet. I haven't I haven't chosen it. And um, how how many times have you always fought with a teammate on the UFC? Have you always shared a car with either Izzy or? Or somebody, or with um, with the boys, or you? How many times have you been on the UFC with sharing a card? Now my debut wasn't. I didn't have a, any any people on the card with me. Okay. Um. Obviously, I, I had mates like Tyson Pedro and and oh, Tai okay. Tuivasa, Mark and Mark Hunt. They were on my debut. Um. But no, none of the the boys from City Kickboxing. Um. But yeah, the, for the rest of the fights, yeah, my boys had a teammate. Either for the rest Israel Shane. Um. Alex was on my card. Oh, no, the one in Shenzhen, sorry. I didn't have a teammate on that card. I fought on the card where um, Zhang and Andraj fought and she knocked her out. Oh, nice. So, and, and won the title. So that that card, I didn't have anyone on that. You had to bring it back to China. That time was a little China. That experience <laughs> in China was a little different than the past experiences, I'm assuming, with it the UFC. A, it, was a lot, it was a lot better, yeah. It Shen, was in Shenzhen. Shenzhen's actually now Shenzhen. Shenzhen. It was very beautiful Shenzhen, in Shenzhen at the time. It's actually, it's actually really nice. Um, it's one of the more developed cities in um, China. Okay. Real westernized as well. Um, it's like the black market of China. So all the electronics and all the um, fakes that get made, they all and the real, they all get made in that city. So um, it was actually, yeah, I would go back. Well, maybe not now, but it was actually cool at the time, yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, hey, what was your favorite country? Do you have a favorite country that you fought in out of the thirteen? Anything that speaks speaks, speaks out to you specific? Well, it's, I've had, yeah, so many, so many cool places that I fought in. You know, it's tough. I know fighting, fighting in in um, the first Kunlun, which was in uh, Pattaya, um, fighting in in Guam with with you. Um, so many good memories over there. Fighting in the Philippines, the Philippines, fighting in China. China's, you know, pet and miss fighting in Japan. You um, fought in Japan, Kai. You even yeah, fought in yeah, Japan. You fought in the Super <laughs> Saitama Arena. Yeah, we're, and you uh, threw a nasty box. soccer kick, bro. You throw, you threw some dope <laughs> soccer kicks. How was it? At least you yeah. got to throw a soccer kick before you got to the UFC, exactly. man. It's kind of good that you bagged that in. Yeah. That bagged one went in, yeah. man. Oh, it was it was a clean one. I did it off his. Um, what was it from? Uh, I had a single leg and ran I ran the pipe. I think ran the pipe. 
and as he was falling and trying to base out, yeah, behind his chin, <laughs> that was I dope, thought he was gonna man. knock him out, and then the, the Japanese ref broke the fight and then let him stand up. I was like, this is bullshit, but it is what it is, you know. Mm. And uh, hey, you fought on New Year's Day. Was, was that the uh, the recent New Year's Eve show? Yeah, it was wow. New, Year's, was, um, New Year's Eve show. King Mo for Crow Cup. That oh was the main man, event. that was the main event. What a yeah. card. Yeah. And then uh, what yeah. time did you guys fight like early in the day when you did that one? Nah, that was um that was like, quite late at night. Like really late at night. I forgot, right? Like they yeah. usually do it like early morning or it's like an all day affair where they have like some crazy amount of fights. Yeah, that was pretty cool though, because uh, uh, my whole family flew out from New Zealand to watch me fight. Because my older brother lives in Japan, so it was the first time my siblings have all been in the same country in like five years. So um, that was pretty special for me. And then we were there for like two weeks after just on holiday. Um, I couldn't really walk, but it was still a good time. Um, oh man. But, I got you. but yeah, that, that was a crazy um, experience just fighting in the, you know, home of pride where risen um, is now such a massive promotion. Um, where else have I fought? I fought in uh, Australia. This is, is second home for me. Um, fighting in you know vegas for the ultimate fighter and and um such a big show when alex won the world title um end of last year that's huge man but, yeah so many so many places um but yeah the ones that stick out are like it's got to be my ufc debut probably in adelaide just because it had meant so much to me i remember when eugene surprised me with that um contract i didn't know that i was gonna get given a contract they just got back from um, a UFC show I think for Izzy or for Dan and um, they were putting a video um, on for the gym so I thought it was a thank you video and then um, they surprised me with Dana White giving me a contract um, and the videos on my my Instagram my Facebook um, you guys probably would have seen it but that, uh, that's the first time like I properly you know broke down and, and cried just because it, it meant so much to me for uh, for so long, I've been trying to, you know, been given the chance, but it had already been taken away or something's happened that it didn't work out. Um, but this time, you know, when I hugged Eugene and he said, you know, you're in, you're finally um, in the UFC, bro. That's when it really hit home and I, I couldn't hold back the tears. It just meant so much to me. So once I realized, you know, now the hard way actually starts when you're in the UFC. Um, yeah, it, it, it's cool that um, he could do something like that and surprise me and, um set something up yeah so so many special moments ufc auckland as well fighting in my hometown um that's a bucket list you know ticked off um having friends and family that haven't actually seen me fight before live um and just to have them there and just be like you know this is what i do now and it's a lot different from when they knew me you know when i was growing up so it's uh, it's pretty cool to have, um share those moments and Show the new generation, you know, there's, there's a blueprint of how to do this now. You don't need to go overseas and train and and, um, and uh, do it over there. You know, you can be homegrown. You can you can do it out of New Zealand and, and um, there's a way around it. There's not just, you know, the blueprint of how to be an All Black, which is our national sport rugby. Um, Israel and Dan, you know, are, are all um, of um, mentors of, you know, how to, how to do the sport. And there's, there's so many um, young guys out there that I know that are, got the abilities um to to get to where you know where we are but um they just need i guess the guidance that um we didn't have back then we were kind of doing it on on the fly and just making up it as we went bro like you know we got to meet so many amazing people like you guys self and um on the way uh yeah that's just the learning curve you take but now the the new generation they don't need to do that they they can still travel if they want to but if they want to get, you know, the, the real training and, and um, the real skills to get you to that next level, we've got it all here now Now at City Cup Boxing. Nice, man. All right, perfect. I'll lead into our next, my, <laughs> the last one. Nice little closing statement, man. For the next yeah. generation, because that's what, you know, this is our goal to this podcast is like to inform and to like, you know, give people like guidance and inspiration. Uh, what what yeah. advice, closing out the show, what advice would you give any up and coming fighters that are just getting into the game? Um, and they want to like pursue their career, but they're not, and they want, and you want to give them like some good advice that they can carry on with themselves to take on for the future. What would you recommend for any upcoming fighters? Um, one, one gift of kind, a little piece of kind. <laughs> <laughs> I've got so many good mentors around me that, um, I, I'm constantly learning off them and, and, um, you know, just, just trying to be a sponge with, um, 
what they're teaching me because I'm always learning myself. You know, I've, I've been in the sport for a, a little while, you know, over 10 years now, um, fighting professionally, um, only 27. So I've got a lot more to learn and a lot more t- in my career. But one thing that um, I would talk to someone that wants to take this as a career or pursue this more seriously as a career, um, just get as much experience as you can, you know, jump into the, those jiu-jitsu competitions that you don't think um, mean anything you know it's just ring time then who cares if you lose that's that's not what you're here to um if you're if your main thing is to get into mma don't worry about losing or or um or uh being under pressure you know you want to be faced with all those hard lessons outside of um the bigger picture which is you know those your pro fights so take those kickboxing fights do the boxing fights do the wrestling matches the jiu-jitsu matches you know just get comfortable being uncomfortable and um absorb as much experience as you can because once you make those big steps into the the big shows or um when you make your pro debut and you, you start to rack up wins um you're gonna thank thank yourself for for doing all those hard lessons um beforehand and um, that will help you in the long run. So, yeah, don't take the easy route. There's no easy way of doing the sport. If you want to learn, you've got to do it the tough way. Um, otherwise, you know, you, you'll, you'll never know um, what it's like to, to get hit. And, and if you do, it'll be in front of thousands of people and it, and it won't feel good. So, um, yeah, just get as much experience as you can and, and um, just enjoy the journey. Though There's going to be highs and lows, but you just got to take it as it comes and um, keep pushing forward. Learn how to. F- this is what martial arts has taught me at a, at a young age. Being bullied at a young age, um, for my height, I was always small, the smallest in my class. Um, but martial arts has always taught me how to face adversity. So, dealing with um, you know bullies and and trying to be the bigger person, where you can always walk away from um, altercations and and violence. Um, you you leave it in the gym, and in the long run, you know you you'd end up potentially where I am, where my bullies back then, you know, my biggest fans now, and um, I do this as a living, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's a lifestyle you take, but um, going on a massive tangent here, but, yeah, it's all it's all hand in hand and it's all about balance. And um, once you make this lifestyle and you make that, that full commitment, uh, martial arts is forever, you know, even though this career isn't forever, um, you can still do martial arts until the day you die. So it's a great lifestyle to take and um, great philosophy to, to live by. Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah, the experience plays part. I remember when you would, uh, when you were, I remember you were fighting in PXC, man, and you were fighting in boxing for your sparring. You were doing, instead of going to Monday sparring, you fight, yeah. you get a boxing fight every single Monday leading up to your fight. Yeah, bro. So I'm in fight tickets, camp, you're taking no. professional, you're <laughs> selling tickets. So, like, let me, like, yeah, let's, let's let the people know the, how, how you used to hustle. Yeah. I know, you know, like, mm-hmm. you would have a fight camp coming up, not for the most money, but for, like you said, for the experience, you know, racking in that ring time. And that's one of the things, right? Yeah. It, like, the, the price tag never really mattered if you can get the experience, right? Yeah, exactly, bro. I was, I was hustling at the cafe, at the, um, at the Tiger Grill, I was selling my boxing tickets for the fight night, saying, you know, come through. I don't know who I'm fighting, but there'll be some good rounds. And then I'll just turn up, hand-wrapped, and um, whoever turned up to fight me, that that was the guy. So there was no weight class, no, um, no, you know, watching footage of your opponent because you don't know who it was. You just jump in there. The first round is we test out and um, we feel them out. So I do that, and then you know, a few weeks later, I'll be fighting MMA just um, just to kind of make ends meet. And that's that, that was the beauty of it back then. There was no pressure. It was just yeah, let's just fight, you know. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. Yeah, getting I love it. The boxing that was like your it was like your Monday sparring. <laughs> then you jump in on wrestling on Tuesday, technique on yeah, Wednesday, bro. back sparring on Friday. Another mo- another exactly. grab another boxing fight, another quick six k bot to get through the week. You know, to get you that chicken exactly, rice. Exactly, right. <laughs> that's not that bad though. Three hundred bucks for some rounds, I'll do it. Yeah, <laughs> my man, yo Kai, thank you so much for having coming on the pl- on the podcast, man. We really appreciate it, brother. And uh, we wanted no, to have you in. Thank we, you for having me. Man, we wanted to have you. You know, we were trying to save these bullets for when you come on live, but we didn't know that the world mm. was going to shut down with the COVID and everything, man. I saw you just before, yeah. bro. I remember the COVID was already popping. I remember I wasn't wearing a mask yeah. and in the airport. <laughs> everybody was like freaking out. And I was like making videos, making fun of it. I was like, fuck yeah. these people. And I was like eating and sneezing. Everybody's freaking out around me. <laughs> 
You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Little did we know, yeah, like two weeks that. later, everything shut down. So it shut down. Yeah. I can't believe I got to see New Zealand. Yo, if we never get to travel again, yeah. I'm glad I got to see New Zealand I before know. it was <laughs> all over, dog. I got to yeah. see New Zealand. And I got to see. I snuck into New Zealand and Japan just before the end of the world. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Hey Kai, I've been yeah, hearing man. about this New Zealand trip for for months now. It's I mean you guys. Oh, really? had a, oh my we god. Get you guys out here. Again. Yo. I JP, I met I met Kai's family, dog. Kai's family is G's. They're a bunch of G's. Dog. I met the Mari family from Kai, bro. He wasn't playing. Yeah, right. I was telling the everybody when I came back. I was like, yo, everybody's the big got, guy. Hey, everybody's got <laughs> swag. They got what? a bunch of big ass Maris in his family. The, the Waikata, the Waikata, the Waikata crew. Is it Waikata? Waikato? Waikato. Where you're originally Wa- from? Waikato. Waikato. Yeah, yeah, Waikato. Yeah. There you go. There you go. He knows. So yeah, Alex, bro, big. I'm I'm small, bro. Oh, small man. My family. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yo, JP, you saw, so you got to see video recorded him in the first tryouts, and now he's, now my man's going to be, now my man's top 10 in the flyweight division, taking the world by storm. Yeah. I want to see on Never ESPN with the highlight real KO on the 50, on 253, brother. I right, say less. Got right, you. My yeah. man's. Hey, <laughs> big ups, brother. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah, episode 27. You oh, you as well, man. Any, um, oh, man. Any plugs or anything you want to give out? Where, did, where can the people find you and follow you? Yo, one sec. I'll just grab something. Hold up. Sure. Oh, yeah. I got my new uh, T-shirt coming out. We're dropping it next week. Uh, this is my new shirt. Oh, nice. <laughs> it's a playoff. It's a playoff uh, Michael Jordan's uh, caricature 1990s basketball. Nice, You know how this bro. movie... You know, as Docker, the last dance. Yeah. yeah. Is he dunking? The last France. The, the last, last France. France. Hey, that's hey. great. <laughs> oh, it's hell the yeah. Signature. So, yeah, these come out next week online. So, where can we get those at? Where can we get those shirts? Um, just on my, my social media, my um, Instagram or Facebook. So, everybody. Um, I'll send you boys one out. No worries, brother. Hey, so where can, where yeah, can the people find you? Kai Kara France? Just, that's just yeah, Kai Kara Kai France, Kara right? France at, yeah. On, I, on Twitter, um, Instagram, or, or Facebook. Um, but yeah, four of us on this next card, September 26, UFC 5253. Um, either Fire, Fire Island or Vegas. Um, this one, you don't want to miss. You know, New Zealand, show up and show out. And uh, we're getting that four peat this time. The Anzac right. takeover continues with the quads. You finna hit quads. In poker, we call that quads. When that's you get four it. of a kind, quads. that's it. That's, that's it. all the cards Bad. in the house. That's, you can't lose that hand, dog. <laughs> with quads, you that's win it. every time, son. So you guys are coming in with that's quad it. aces. Shut the show down. Bop. Come in. <laughs> raw dog. Nah. Yeah, you're going to give it to him. Give it to him raw dog, son. Who? <laughs> Hell yeah. Anyways, brother, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We out.